Matthew 24, verse number 32. The Bible says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see these things, uh, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you for the reading of your word. And Lord, as many times there, when it comes down to eschatology and it comes down to things that has to do with prophecy of the last days, some things do go over my head. So I pray that the Spirit of God would lead and guide us to all truth. Lord, help me to correctly interpret your Scripture, and Lord, help me to give it to you, give it to the people as you've given it to me. God, I pray you would speak to our hearts tonight, God. I, I pray, Lord, tonight, Lord, that if there be anybody among us, Lord, that does not know you truly as Lord and Savior, God, that the Spirit of God, Lord, would draw them to an old-fashioned altar of repentance and faith and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ tonight, Lord. I pray you would do the supernatural, God. And I pray for the men that are here that shed their testimonies tonight and earlier this morning, Lord, you bless them. Help them to get on fire for you, Lord, and be used of you. And God, I pray you'd speak to our hearts now in this next little bit. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want to focus on one verse of Scripture, and I'm just going to expound off of some other things, but I want to go ahead and give you my thought. Verse number 34, he says, Verily, or should I say truly, I say unto you, This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. I want to preach just a little bit tonight on this one thought on this generation. This generation, not the generation of 10 years ago, not the generation of tomorrow, but the generation of today. Amen? Now, I will say this tonight, that when it comes down to reading a lot of things that has to do of prophecy and all these different things that's going to happen, I really don't know how everything's really going to unfold. I'm not one of these uh, preachers that claim, oh, it's going to happen like this, this, and this. What I do know is Jesus Christ is coming back soon and very soon tonight. What I do know is God is keep his promise tonight. Amen. What I do know is Jesus Christ is coming back in a moment in the twinkling of an eye tonight. You know how fast the twinkling of an eye tonight is? The, the twinkling of an eye is faster than the speed of light. You want to know how fast the speed of light can travel tonight? The speed of light is so fast tonight that it can literally circle the earth seven times or more in one second. Amen. That's how fast the speed of light can travel and Jesus Christ is coming faster than the speed of light tonight. Amen. He's coming faster than anybody can blink their eye tonight. He's coming faster than anybody can make a decision tonight. Amen. So that's why it is best to be ready for the second coming of Christ tonight. Amen. Because he's coming to snatch his church up out of here. Amen. One's going to be left and the other's going to be taken. Amen. There's going to be one that's going to be left behind and there's another, another one's going to be gone tonight. Amen. And uh, I want to say this tonight. He begins to talk about the fig tree or the budding of the fig tree. He talks about it differently in every single gospel. Many of those interpret that fig tree to be the nation of Israel becoming a nation once again tonight. Amen. He begins talking about how that, na that Israel become a nation once again. Can I say that there's not one more bit of prophecy tonight that needs to be fulfilled before the Lord comes back tonight? There's not one bit of prophecy. Listen, there's not one thing holding the Lord back from calling His church home tonight. Amen. Not one single thing tonight. 
And he begins to talk about some things tonight. Can I say this tonight, the second coming of Christ, or should I say the rapture of the church? For those who are saved, it's going to be a blessed event. Amen. Listen, I'm looking forward to meet the Lord in the air. I'm looking forward to, to, to joining Jesus Christ and seeing him face to face tonight. Amen. But let me say this for those who are not saved. It's going to be a terrible event. It's going to be literal hell on earth tonight. Amen. Listen, imagine what it would be like tonight that, I mean, you've heard the message over and over and over throughout your life. You've been warned over and over and over throughout your life that Jesus Christ is coming. You better be ready. You better have your house in order. And then all of a sudden, everybody in your family, everybody in the church, all of a sudden they're gone. You know what the Bible says also for those who have been left behind who have heard the truth and who have known the truth, who have known what it means to be saved, who know how it is to be saved, but yet have rejected the gospel and neglected the gospel. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 that God will send them a strong delusion that they will believe a lie and be damned for all eternity. Why? Because they believed not the love of the truth that they might be saved tonight. Amen? Listen, I'm not trying to be mean tonight, but I'm trying to be truthful tonight. Listen, friend, if you've heard the truth, you know what it means to be saved, and you neglect salvation, and you're left behind during the rapture, my dear friend, there's nothing in this Bible that says you'll ever have another chance to be saved. Amen? I'm sorry, but that's just true. Amen? Now, what does the Bible say about generations man the Bible talks about generations I believe today's generation we're dealing with a weak generation today we're dealing with a wimpy generation today we're dealing with a worldly generation today and I believe we're dealing with a wicked generation today the Bible says there is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother amen there is a generation that pure in their own eyes and yet not washed from their own filthiness. Amen. A self-righteous generation that sees nothing wrong with their sin. Amen. There is a generation whose teeth are as daggers, the Bible talks about, to devour the poor and needy from off the earth. Amen. That's just generation today. This generation. You know what I read in the book of Judges though? I read in the book of Judges from time to time, God would allow a wicked judge to rule over Israel for a certain time. Israel would begin to get sorry before God. They would get humble before God and repent and cry out to God for God to send them a man to rule over them who would judge over them in a rightful manner. And God would have mercy upon that generation and God would spare that generation. You know what the best thing that could happen for this generation in America today is for God to spare this generation to have mercy on us. Amen. Let me say this tonight. Listen, as much as I'm for Trump, amen, I want to say this for the record tonight. There is no man, no woman that can make America great again tonight. Amen. God is the one who makes a nation great and makes a nation terrible tonight. And our only hope is our nation turning back to one nation under God tonight. Amen. That is our only hope tonight. Amen, amen. I'm telling you what, listen, we need a generation that's going to seek after God. Amen. This generation, what are we going to do today in this generation? What's it going to take for us to see a move of God in this generation today? Let me say this tonight, regardless of what happens in the elections this year, Amen. Listen, there's still a God in heaven. Amen. And there's still a God in heaven that can send about a mighty revival in this land. Amen. Listen, our land is not dictated by some man or some woman. It is dictated by God this morning. And see, I believe a lot of people have lost sight of that. A lot of people have lost sight. Listen, God's the one that can touch a nation. God's the one that can turn a nation around. Amen. Listen, is not Second Chronicles 5.17 still in the book? I might have quoted the wrong mailbox, but I think y'all know where I'm going at with that. Amen. Number one, what's it going to take in this generation? Number one, it's going to take a stand for truth. 
a stand for truth. Let's look, look with me in verse number 9 through 12. The Bible says this, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended. Are we not living in a day where everybody gets offended? Everybody's just offended about everything. Amen? And shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive me. We got a lot of them on TV. Amen, by the way. And because uh, iniquity shall abound and the love of many shall wax cold. We need some that's going to stand for truth today. You know, our generation today is being pumped full of nothing but lies. I'm talking about lies through the media, lies through the news, lies through our school systems, lies through our generation today, lies through the pulpit today, lies through our churches today. We need some people that's going to stand for truth today. For truth. You know, truth has become a foreign thing in this day and age that we live. I promise you this, truth has become something so foreign, I don't even know really what else to say about it. But let me say this, the Bible says, Preach the word, be instant in season, not a season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering. For the time, listen, for the time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned into fables. The Bible goes on to say this, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time shall some depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisies, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. That's why the Bible says this, to buy the truth and sell it not. Amen? Listen, you read in the Old, you read in the New Testament when it just took about 12 men filled with the Holy Spirit of God to turn the world upside down. I wonder what God could do with a whole entire church filled with the Holy Ghost going out trying to meet, trying to reach people. Listen, this is a big city. I'm telling you what, when we drove through this city earlier today, I'm telling you what, it, it's like, wow. We've ne listen, we don't see stuff like that really get around, get around and see a lot of that kind of stuff. But listen, I'm telling you what, you can reach people. Listen, what this world needs is to see some Christians filled with the Spirit of God. Amen? You say, what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit of God? Filled with this book and letting the Spirit of God control you. Amen? By the way, getting filled with the Spirit of God, you don't care what everybody thinks about you either. Amen, amen. You know why today that truth has become so foreign? It's because we have adopted this thing today called uh, relativism truth. Amen. What, what you used to have and what still exists today and still works is what I like to call absolute truth. Amen. Listen, absolute truth is what has always worked and always will work and absolute truth will always be the thing that stands the test of time. But you know what men have made today is what they call relativism truth. I, I'm barely pronouncing it. What relativism truth says, well... You know, brother, you might have believed that. That might have been true about 10 years ago. But, you know, since media says it's not true today, that don't apply to us anymore today. Uh, well, you know, that, that might have really worked for you back then, but that just doesn't work today. Amen? I mean, you know, a relativism truth says, well, you know, that might work for you, but that doesn't work for me simply because I don't believe it. Amen? Listen. You saying that you believe in relativism truth versus me saying I believe in absolute truth is almost like this. It's almost like I were to tell you that I believe in the law of gravity tonight and you were to tell me I don't believe in the law of gravity. I don't care what you say, Brother David. I don't believe the law of gravity really works. And I were to say, okay, why don't we test this theory out? Why don't we get on top of this church and test the theory out? And one of us jump off first. How about you jump first? You know what's going to happen? You probably ain't going to jump. And guess what's going to happen? If you do jump, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be carried off in an ambulance regardless of your belief 
and your unbelief tonight. Amen. Listen, the truth is still going to stand regardless of a person's belief and unbelief tonight. Listen, the truth is still the truth whether you like it or not. You say, well, I believe it. If God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. No, if God said it, that settles it whether you believe it or not tonight. That settles it. That settles it, friend. You know, this older generation of men... They used to stand for something, they're dying off. Amen. I think about the story when Elijah had a young man by the name of Elijah. You read about how that Elijah, he's carried off into a whirlwind and his mantle falls, and he goes to give Elijah a double portion of the power of God that fell on his life. And as he's being taken off into the whirlwind, Elijah begins to take, pick up the mantle. The Bible says he stood at the brook of Jordan. Amen. Would to God that our young people today will take the mountain, the mantle today. Amen. Listen, the listen, the older generations dying off today. Amen. The gray-headed men of God that seen the power of God fall in their life, they're dying off today. What we need is some more young people today that get on fire for God and say, Come hell or high water, I'm standing for truth today. That's what we need today. We need a generation that's going to get on fire for God. That's going to bring me to my next point. Number two, we need not only a stand for truth, we need number two, we need some sold out Christians. Some sold out Christians. We're going to skip over a little bit to verse number 45. The Bible says, Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath, ru hath made rule over his household to give them meat in due season. Blessing is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall findeth so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of. Amen? Why we need some sold out Christians today. Amen? Listen, I'm talking about, listen, this world is tired of seeing wishy-washy Christians today. This world is tired of seeing people that claims the name of Jesus but yet they see them out in the ballroom Sunday night after church. Amen? Amen? For some reason I felt led to say that. I don't know why the Holy Ghost wanted me to say that. Listen, listen, the, an apathetic life is a pathetic way to live and what the world needs to see is not just Christianity by definition, but Christianity by demonstration tonight. We need some sold out Christians today. Listen, the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You know what a double-minded Christian is. They're, they got just enough of the world in them. They're not happy in church. And they got just enough church in them. They're not happy in the world. And they're just riding the fence right there in the middle. And they can't be happy one way or another. Listen, you want the joy of the Lord in your life? Get sold out and on fire for God. Amen. Get on fire for God and let Him ignite you for the Spirit of God tonight. Sold out Christians. I'm talking about Christians that when somebody looks at you, they know whose side you're on. I remember years ago, back, back in the years when I was in Bible college, matter of fact, I went witnessing at the, uh, the mall there. And there was this guy, I think he might have been a Mexican guy or whatever. He had just moved to America. He said, I've been living here in America for about seven years. And I've been witnessing to him, just sharing Scripture with him. And he said, I moved down here and I've been living here in America for seven years. This is the first time I've ever had anybody come up to me and share their doctrine of what they believe. And actually, I can actually tell that they believe what they're talking about. In America, the land of the free... It's supposed to be a Christian nation. First time, he says, first time anybody's ever came up to him and said that, and witnessed to him about who Jesus Christ is. I'm not saying that to brag about myself. I'm saying that to the shame of America. America. We need a, we, listen, we need a mighty move and a mighty wave of God in our nation today. 
Listen our, listen, our hope is not getting President Trump in again. Our hope is a revival and a great awakening like we haven't seen before. That's what we need in America today. Amen? Amen, amen. Listen, I mean, I, I'm talking about this, Christians that'll get actually excited about the things of God. Listen, we can get excited about our favorite TV shows. We can get excited about our favorite football game. We can get excited about our favorite baseball game. But for some reason, when somebody comes up here, tries to lift up the name of the Lord, why is it that God's people can't get excited about that? about Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins and resurrected from the grave on the third day. Why is it that doesn't do something on the inside of us? It should. It should. It should. Moving on. Number three. If we're going to do something in this generation, we're going to reach this generation, we need to have some sober minds that are watchful. Some sober minds that are watchful. Verse number 42. The Bible says, Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what hour, had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Let me read you another verse of Scripture that it says in the book of Luke when it's talking about just about the same stuff. Luke chapter 21, verses 34 and 30 through 36. The Bible says, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unawares, for as a snare shall it come upon all them that dwell on the face of the earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things, all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So in other words, what the Bible's saying is, as God's people, we need to be being watchful. Amen? What kind of things does the Bible say we need to be watchful against? Well, first of all, we need to be watchful for the Lord's coming. That's, that's a given. I think we also need to be watchful in prayer. Listen, the greatest tool you have as a Christian is your prayer life. Amen? Be watchful in prayer. The Bible says pray always with prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Listen, you think about some of the men of God back in the day. Charles Spurgeon, D.L. Moody, David Bernard, uh, Charles Finney. All those different men that you read about that have written great books and you read about how the power of God fell on their life. What's something you notice that's the same about all of them? They were great men of prayer. Matter of fact, people like Charles Finney who had so much of the presence and the power of God on him that when he would walk inside of a factory, there was so much of the power of God oozing off of him, they had to shut the factory down because people were getting saved left and right. You say, is that really possible today? It is. It is. It's possible today. And let me also say this. This lost world is looking for something real like that today. Another thing we need to be watchful and sober-minded against is the allurements of this world. The Bible says, guard your heart, keep your heart with all diligence, for out, for out of it are the issues of life. Amen? I'm looking around and seeing a lot of older people, a lot of younger people, a lot of teenagers tonight, but I promise you this, Old Slewfoot, the devil, would love to take you down the same road that some of these men have talked about. Amen? I'm looking around at some young people that if you're not careful and you don't take heed to what I'm preaching to tonight, a year from now, six months from now, two years from now, you'll be in the same place that some of those men talked about. I'm not being mean tonight. I'm being real with you tonight. Listen, the devil, just like God's no respecter of persons tonight, the devil ain't no respecter of persons tonight either. The devil sees some young women in here, he wants to take every bit of purity that you've got right now tonight. The devil sees some young men in here, he wants to take every bit of integrity that you've got right now. And he wants to ruin and wreck everything in your life. That's why we need to be watchful. Be watchful. 
And let me say this, there is nobody in here that is above falling. There is nobody in here that is above ruining and wrecking everything in their lives. I promise you that tonight. I'm looking at some people. Listen, I, there's been some people. If, if I got paid for every single time I heard about somebody inside of a church that I thought, unto God, they would have never and found out, oh, oh yeah. Let me say this tonight, that the devil has many lures and he has, he has a great big tackle box. How many of y'all like to play? How many of y'all like to go fishing? How many of y'all got a great big tackle box? You, you got a different lure for every different type of fish you're trying to get. You go out there in that boat or wherever it is, if you don't catch that fish with one lure, guess what? You're going to grab that other lure, make sure that lure's all nice and shiny, and just throw that thing out there. Well, the devil's the same way. If he can't get you with one thing, he'll get you with something else. By the way, the way the devil works, he's very subtle. Amen. Let me say this to him. I'm about to move to my last point tonight. Talking about being sober minds that are watchful. Let me say this. The Bible still says that, uh, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering thine own self, lest thou also be tempted. You know something that I've noticed, and, and, and I... Just give me a couple more minutes and I'll be done. What I've noticed, in, especially in some of the churches, some of the brethren I thought I had and everything else, and then all of a sudden I mess up and I find out they ain't my brother anymore. Amen? And, um, you know, it, 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 it's mighty funny that, you know, it, it's one thing, listen, when it happens to somebody in our family, all of a sudden then we care, but if it happens to somebody we're not close to, we ought to treat everybody like they're a part of our family. Hey. Amen. Yeah. Listen, you know somebody that's struggling with something? You know somebody that, that's down and out somewhere that's not even in this church anymore? You ought to be trying to call them up, trying to get them back in the house of God. Right. Amen, amen. Listen, I, I've known, and, and maybe I'm ranting here. I hope I'm not wrong with this, but I'm just going to call it like it is. I've known some, some, some Baptists and some independent Baptists that don't make sure you don't mess up because they're going to write you off. We ought to have the spirit of grace to try to get them back in the right fellowship with God, to get them back in the house of God, to get them not to kick them while they're down. Amen? That's not the spirit of Christ tonight. The spirit of Christ says, okay, you messed up, but let's try to get you back in the right restoration and fellowship tonight. That ought to be our attitude in the church tonight. Not to kick somebody while they're down and say, well, I knew that they were doing that the whole time. Well, if you knew about it the whole time, why didn't you try to talk to them? Why didn't you pray for them? I'm sorry I had to scratch that itch just for a minute. That's going to bring me to my last point tonight. Amen. Uh, for this generation, there needs to be some sympathy for the hardened and the hurting tonight. Amen. Turn with me to chapter 25. Chapter 25, we'll read a few more verses of Scripture and I'll be done tonight. Chapter 25, verse 35, Jesus says, For I was, for I was in hunger, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When, when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, or came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto thee, As much as ye have done unto one of the least of my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Let me say this tonight, and, and I'm about to be done. Christianity is, is not always about all the scripture we can quote tonight. About how sometimes, a lot of times, it's about how we treat our fellow brother. Man. He said, he says, as much as you've done it unto these little ones. Now, prophetically speaking, he's talking about Israel right there. But I believe there's some application for right here, right now. 
Amen? I see my brother over here struggling with something and I just walk right on past him like nothing's going on. Guess what? I did that unto Jesus as well. Y'all ever heard the saying of what would Jesus do? I'd almost change it to where would Jesus be? Amen? Where so listen, if Jesus was still walking the earth in a physical form today, where would he be tonight? Would he be in the nice looking churches where everybody's dressed up nice? Or would he be out there in the streets, in the highways, in the hedges, in the prisons, in the rescue missions, in the homeless shelters? Where would Jesus be? Ask yourself that. And then ask yourself, where should I put myself as a Christian to go and reach people? Amen? Compassion. Compassion tonight. Amen? Listen, the great Samaritan had compassion on the man that was left for half dead when the high priest, and I believe it was a Levite, they saw this man just laying down there and he walked on right by him. And the great Samaritan is the only one who stopped by where this man was at. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, he binds up his wounds. He takes oil and pours the oil in there. He takes the wine, and, and then not only that, he gives him a place to stay. I'm so glad when Jesus came by my way. <laughs> I was left for half dead. Amen. And I'm talking about he came by with the oil, anointed me in the Holy Ghost of God, washed me in his precious blood, and gave me a home in heaven. Amen. I'm glad when everybody gave up on me, God didn't give up on me, and Jesus Christ came where nobody else would go down to. My life. This generation. I'm telling you what, we're living in a generation today that seriously needs help. My question to you tonight is just this. Are you burdened over this generation? Are you burdened over this generation? What are you going to do about this generation? I'm not talking about what are you going to do if this person gets an election or that. I'm talking about what are you going to do about this generation today? Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.